Hi, everyone. Welcome to the latest episode of the AdQuick Advertising Podcast, a podcast that discusses everything from marketing, technology, culture, trends, and everything in between. You're joined today with your hosts, uh, myself, Adam Singer, and Chris Gaddick. And our guest today is no other than Isaac Simpson. He is the founder of Will, a digital and creative agency that is one of the more interesting uh, startup agencies that we have come across. Um, he's a former creative director, a popular sub stacker and writer, and a provocateur sometimes on Twitter and other social networks. We're a big fan. He always makes us think. So um, thank you, Isaac, for joining us on the podcast today and welcome. Thanks so much for having me, Adam and Chris. Uh, glad to be here. Great. So let's just dive into it. And I'm sure we're going to share a lot of cool links about your thinking and ideas. But to, to, to really start with a big question, we have a lot of questions for you. But one that's on everyone's mind right now is really simple. Why is advertising seem so bad? Why does it seem so stuck? What exactly is happening from your perspective? So you're seeing this notion of stuck culture everywhere. Lindy Mann has talked about it uh, on his Twitter. He had an interesting article about it. So I think everywhere we're seeing this same glut, a creative glut, uh, certainly in Hollywood, where the mainstream has never been less respected. Um, you know, the Os just look at the numbers in the Oscars. It's the plummeted like 10 million viewers every year to an all-time low. Um, <clears throat> so the, uh, you're seeing it on TV, Netflix, the Netflixification. Every time you open Netflix, it's crap. And you're also seeing it in advertising and really seeing it in advertising. And so the question is why? You know, why is this happening? And, and you know, another analog, analogous question is why is this happening simultaneously with the rise of so-called woke uh, television and so-called woke um, movies and woke advertising, which is obviously something that is on everybody's mind and they're constantly talking about it and thinking about it and culture war, yada, yada. Um, why are these things happening? Um, I think that the true answer is very complex. It's a, it's a uh, combination of a lot of different factors, of course, like anything like this would be. But specifically in the world of advertising, the thing that I've seen personally is the cultures with which give birth to advertising are not cultures that could possibly give birth to anything good ever. <laughs> and and the, the, that's because they've become, um, as some people who are smarter than me have said, cults of safetyism. And not only that, they've been places where everyone is encouraged to be creative. So there's a and one of my favorite David Ogilvy quotes is uh, a team cannot make an advertisement and I doubt that there has ever been an agency of any consequence that isn't the shadow of a single man. So what he's saying there is the same thing we know about auteurs it's the same thing we know about art of all kinds which is that great art whether it's an ad or whether it's a movie it requires a certain like singularity of vision right? Like a camel is a horse, <clears throat> is a horse made by committee, right? So <laughs> making things by committee inherently does not lead to good. It, it doesn't lead, it, it does not lead to good uh, outcomes. And I think that what we're seeing inside the agency world, I've certainly seen inside the agency world is that not only is it by committee, but it's an extreme committee. So now um, the creative vision of the creatives really isn't prioritized. And rather, what's prioritized is this type of environment that where everyone has an absolutely equal voice. Nobody can be shouted out. Uh, a lot of, um, I've experienced personally, a lot of creative decision-making by democracy, which is always a terrible way to do it. And uh, of course, you see a lot of focus grouping, which, you know, focus grouping has always been around, but there used to be a uh, creative director veto, right? Or like a final cut that the, the kind of angry creative could say, ah, screw, you know, Don Draper, what does he always do? He throws the binder of the insights into the trash every time, right? Whereas now uh, you don't really have that ability anymore. And, and you see this proceduralism and managerialism has really taken over advertising 
uh, perhaps more so than any other industry. And it's, I think that's the reason for it. It's interesting you mention um, music as one of the areas that hasn't fallen prey to this. I, I think you did, if not now, earlier uh, before yeah, we started. Yeah. And um, there's a great clip of Frank Zappa actually warning about the death of creativity due to specifically the highest paid person's opinion. Um, it's succumbing to groupthink where it was previously like, you know, a hippie who sort of rose up through the ranks. And actually it turned out that person would take less risks than the sort of cigar chomping old guy who would say, "Ah, eh, I don't know. I don't know what's happening here. Let's take a chance on this, you know, on this sort of wild idea. And that was how music, the music industry sort of operated in, in the sixties. Yeah, absolutely. You, you see this also reflected to return to the, the Hollywood analogy. It's like we had this evil, uh, tyrannical Hollywood mogul archetype like Weinstein and, um, you know, Brian Grazer, you know, th th these like crazy guys who throw a phone at your head uh, when you do something wrong. And, uh, you know, when I moved to Hollywood, that person was still in control and it was terrifying. They were terrible. I mean, don't get me wrong. These people were deeply evil, bad, bad, bad people, but they've been replaced by who they've re been replaced by people like, um, you know, this woman at Netflix, who's head of TV content, Bella Bajaria, who says outwardly that she doesn't believe in objective goodness or badness, right? She doesn't think there is good or bad. She thinks it's entirely subjective. And it's, and she says, my only job is to super serve the audience. So, so like she doesn't think there is good or bad. Whereas that tyrannical Weinstein type, they were terrible people, but they truly believed that there was good and there was bad. And they were going to take a, if you were good, like they were going to let it come through. Right. Whereas now that's been replaced by this technocratic kind of like, you know, community, like everybody gets a voice, everything's equal, which just doesn't pressurize the system in such a way that it cre can create anything good. Yeah, the, the Netflix example is super interesting because um, on the, I know people on the product team that are super good at what they do. And I, I, there's probably not too much detail I can give that's interesting, but they don't necessarily love what's happening on the creative side of that company. Um, I have a friend who's a very outspoken user on Twitter. You might know who's the next Netflix guy. And we've had conversations about this. And it, it, it kind of cracks me up because they're one of the companies that is sort of, um, you know, at the intersection of of tech, media, and culture. And it's, it's funny how the engineers there um, don't love all of the content. At the same time, though, you could argue um, Netflix's programming doesn't necessarily follow the same script as big media, right? Like they have certain comedians and certain, you know, individuals on there who are definitely not part of, you know, the, 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 the okay group for necessarily the people that might say, you know, oh, there is no good or bad, right? What do you, what do you mean exactly? Like, so like you... they have people like Chappelle on there for, oh, yeah. you know, comedic skits. So it, it's, there, there's some push and pull still, even out of Netflix, I think, where they recognize iconoclast talent that might not fall into, you know, it might not make the left happy or the right happy. And they're sort of, you know, this voice of their own, right? Well, but the, the only thing I would say is they, they can only do that with incumbents, they cannot do it with new talent. They, they can only uh, rec like look what Netflix does, right? Netflix is the perfect example of this. They give total carte blanche and endless money to any auteur. And they say, go make a seven hour, you know, go make The Irishman, Martin Scorsese, which is a complete mess. It's a total disaster because there's nobody, there's no asshole fighting with him saying, no, Marty, we're not doing whatever you want today. Like, because he's an incumbent. So who's ever at the top of that food chain is just like, oh no, I would, I would never argue with Martin Scorsese. Right. Yeah. But like, they can only do that with people who've been grandfathered in. They can't see new talent because they can't recognize it. Yeah. It's, it's, that's unfortunate. And I recognize a lot of that in seeing, um, you know, and seeing young, talented media and creatives I know get get passed over for safe choices, which which is what Zappa was talking about. We could probably go into the media topic forever. Let's let's come back to that. I want to 
dive further into the ad sector because I've read so much of your thinking on our industry. And but maybe let's talk about something other than culture for a minute because there's so much there. And um, sure. But I want to go through a few topics. So in your post or one of your posts that I read about the um the the sort of mess that is the ad industry you, you have a great diatribe where you talked about the sort of baroque sprawling empire of SaaS tools of meetings about meetings of basically inefficiency in 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 the parts of advertising that you would hope would be more efficient so people could have time for more creative work and so um you know, th th this sort of goes alongside with the take no risk stuff, but it, it does seem like this culture of, you know, overly meetings and having 10 different SaaS tools you have to make the same update in. Like, um, what's your take there from running a small agile shop? Why do you think big brands actually allow this to happen? I have no idea why they allow it to happen. It, it seems it, it completely bewilders me beyond all belief. And it's what makes me think that what's going on is not capitalism, really. You know, like with the, this glut we're experiencing is is not really a capitalistic function, but it's something else because you see the amount of waste in these agencies spent on SAT, useless SaaS programs that don't work and don't do anything and useless people who sit around and click buttons on the SaaS platforms. So my favorite one is Workfront, which is the perfect name because it is the front of work. It's like not doing work. It is pretending to do work. And I worked at a place that was like, I actually just talked to another guy who worked there and he was like, oh yeah, no, that this place that I worked at was like the worst of the worst when it came to this stuff. And they used Workfront, and it was like all anybody ever did was click buttons inside Workfront to indicate the work that they had been doing. So it was like, oh, write five taglines. So somebody would literally, I saw people at this agency, and you know, both of you guys know this, the worst hack writing in the world in advertising. Imagine you asked me to write five lines, and I write five lines that are variations on the same line. And, and delivered that to you as five lines, right? So it would be like, for whatever life throws your way. And then the next line would be like, for whatever uh, the road throws your way. And then it, it, like five of those. And that's what the creatives would deliver as their five lines. They would spend literally maybe 20 seconds, you know, like maybe two minutes. Hmm. And then the entire exercise was to report all the work you'd done inside Workfront and then like submit it for review over here and then click this button and then move your like progress bar over here. So like 95% of the time was spent using Workfront and not doing the creative work. And I got into this company. And again, I will say this company was by like a very bad version of this. Not every place is this bad. But when I got in there, I was a creative director. I, it was my job to run the teams. I just immediately removed everybody from everything. I was like, no, never use Workfront. Just use Google Docs. We do everything outside of this. I'll deal with it. Don't worry. And of course, what happened? I immediately get in trouble with everybody, even though the client work we're doing is not only far better than anything they've ever done, which they say, we're bringing in money You know, from this client. We're upselling our creative strategy. So it's like, I cannot understand why there is no procurement person inside these companies saying we're not getting our, our, our value out of work from. Why are we spending our money on this? Why are we spending our money on these two totally useless people? Because that's what procurement people do. Procurement people, their whole job is to like hedge fund an agency, shrink it down to the, to the absolute minimum. So if that's what a procurement person is doing, and everybody in, like if you've read Frenemies, right? The book Frenemies. Yep. It's all about the, the dawn of procurement people and how they ruin the industry because they cut out all the fat of the system. But that's not true. The, the system's fatter than it's ever been. It's just being spent on dumb shit instead of creative. So like, I, I, it's a total mystery to me, man. I, I, can't, I can't understand why capitalist people would ever do this. It, I, I don't know if you have any thoughts. No, why. I, 
I, I, have t- I have two thoughts here. I've, I've seen a lot of the similar stuff. And I would say for anyone listening who does run an agency or does run a marketing team, probably, as Isaac was saying, one of the top ways you could annoy your best talent and drive them to leave would be give them processes that don't make sense and don't listen to their feedback on their tool set. Like if they have a way of working, whether it's Google Docs or you know some other tool that the team really likes, and you're being sort of just um, you know tyrannical over how you say, oh well, we're doing it this way because we've always done it this way, which is is a non-answer. Um, then you're going to lose your best talent, and ultimately, that's going to be you know in advertising, your your talent is the product to a good extent. So I'd be wary there. Um, so hopefully it's self-serving in, in in that regard. And then the other thing that I think will help out, because I've noticed this as well, is um, you know, the the Fed getting off ZERP, right? So now yeah. we no longer have this environment where um, you know, from a macro perspective, a friend of mine has put it to me like, you know, imagine having a, a forest that isn't, you know, there, there's no forest fire for a while, right? And so now when you do have a fire, it's this big uncontrollable thing. So really the Fed keeping rates at zero created this perfect storm for everything from bloated, you know, management at ad firms to, you know, dog coins going up billions of dollars in valuation to, you know, SPAC mania and all these other things. I think that, um, you know, I, I hate to point at the Fed because it's so conspiratorial, but at the same time, at some point you can blame the chaos and the sort of excessive whatever in the business world that left so many teams checked out on a interest rate environment that was that was perhaps too easy right and that's frustrating because if you were at a team that was really executing well and you weren't taking you know whatever free money benefits you, you never even really saw that so i know people who Whenever anyone shares the thing about, you know, the Fed and the free money thing, they're like, what are you talking about? You know, our company has been grinding through this. And I'm like, yeah, you know, that's unfortunate when there's companies that were getting infinite funds from crypto, right? And they were spending money on stadiums. So it's it's a wild right. world. Um, I'm hoping we'll see everything you've said is true and I've seen as well. I'm hoping we will see a sort of return to form in the ad sector. I know Chris has a lot of thoughts on, on macro econ. Chris, do you want to comment on that? Is that pretty much what's I, happening? Am I, I missing mean, something? I'd like to kind of explore what is leading to this risk aversion, right? Why do we have a lack of bold, innovative ideas uh, coming out of advertising shops? I mean, if we, if we kind of think about the Super Bowl, right? And this kind of goes back to Isaac's uh, whole comment on, you know, designed by committee or creativity by committee or creativity by democracy, as he said, where everybody scores what their favorites are, you know, one through five. And basically what you have is a bunch of mediocre shit ideas that don't inspire, that don't delight. Um, and you could see the group think in the Super Bowl, right? Which was, you could probably guess what the makeup of the advertising agency uh, that actually put the ideas together. They're probably, you know, early forties, uh, as, as high as 50 because you got like a bunch of celebrities and you know nostalgia commercials that nobody nobody under 35 could even identify you know I'm what like, who I, are these people right i i think um yeah. isaac talks about goat dads i'd love for him Hype to dad. explain that because i actually think that goes to explain chris's question pretty well and that's such a like a great observation when i read that post i was just shaking my head yes the whole time i mean so yeah. Yeah. Before no, sorry, you jump sorry. in, Isaac. Uh, so yeah, there's the there's the piece where it's like the nostalgia ride, and l- let's let's touch upon the other the other piece. I'm excited to jump into that. Wait, sorry. What, clarify what you just meant there, Chris. Oh, I was saying so. There's there's the piece where there's the group think, but then uh, let's let's talk about how these group thinks ideas are spreading across organizations, not just one, because obviously agencies service more than one advertisers, but you see a lot of commonalities in advertising campaigns in products that are across various categories, right? And yeah. so that's what Hype Dad relates to, right? Well, that's what the Hype Dad and the GOAT, that's what that piece was about. Um, so that piece was about this notion of Hype Dad. So Hype Dads was actually coined by my friend, Sean Monahan, who um, absolute marketing advertising genius. He was the guy behind K-Hole and he actually uh, came up with the term, term Normcore, with the other one, just had a whole moment, like you know, ten years ago or something. So this guy's a, an amazing advertising strategist, 
And he had a short piece about the vibe shift. I don't know if you guys remember this, but in his vibe, it was very short and it was very just like, you know, his style, which is very cool and like not totally fleshed out. But he, he mentioned this idea of a hype dad. He didn't explain it too much, but he kind of like just hinted at. It. So I expanded upon his idea of a hype dad. And what is a hype dad? This, this is a piece called Vibe Shift to Destroy uh, Marketing World. Uh, that went like viral a year or so ago uh, on my Substack. But a hype dad is a character, an archetype that you run into in the world of advertising. And it's insane how consistent this character is. And that's why the piece went viral because everybody was like, oh my God, I know that exact guy. And everybody's worked with this dude. So he's like a 50s-ish, 50s-ish aging kind of like, surfer, hip hop, sneakers, dad type of guy. And they're always kind of tall. I've found not necessarily, but many of them are tall. They all like have a really expensive bike, but they can't use it because they have like chronic back problems. They, they pay a lot of lift sur service to surfing and skateboarding. They're kind of, they're Gen X and they are totally disconnected from everything. They, they're, they're all making like 500,000, a million dollars a year. They, but since they're the creative director or the ECD of these agencies, they have this impetus to be cool. People look to them to the, be the barometer of cool, which doesn't really make any sense because it used to be reversed, right? It used to be you had the Don Draper at the top, you know, this business suit wearing businessman. And then below them, he, he relied on his lower people to tell him what cool was more or less. Whereas now, like everything else, it's been reversed where that hype dad guy, the guy at the top of the creative food chain inside agencies, he doesn't want to be suit wearing businessman. He wants to be 23 year old, like cool hip hop guy who's listening to Kendrick Lamar and like skateboarding, you know, and surfing all day, right? He's uncomfortable being the old white guy. He really does not want to be that, but he is that, right? So these guys are all completely out of touch and they're all leading these creative brainstorms all the time. And no lie. In one year, I did a bunch of freelancing mm -hmm. at like three or four different agencies. A hype dad archetype guy brought the same idea to the table, which was this idea of GOAT, greatest of all time. So greatest of all time is this term that has been used in the black community forever. Like growing up, I grew up with a lot of black people. GOAT was, we used, said it all the time. It was something you said about basketball players, blah, blah, blah. It took 15 years or whatever for this to bubble up into mainstream culture, this thing GOAT. And it happened in like one year. And for whatever reason, all these hype dads who all have like 12 year old kids clearly heard their sons or daughters saying goat, like at the dinner table or whatever. And suddenly in one year, you have like 25 advertisements that are all goat, greatest of all time. And it's all about like a goat, the visual metaphor of a literal goat. And then the goat, the product being the goat, right? So it's like a soap ad. It's like a Postmates ad. It's a, there's like 25 companies that all ran a goat ad in the same year. And you're just thinking, how does this type of convergent evolution happen, right? I mean, you see, you see convergent evolution of creative ideas happening all the time, but this was extreme. It was happening everywhere. And it's because all these hype dads who don't have good ideas at all and don't actually go with what they think is good because they've learned to kind of hate their own ideas and and they're making these um they're making their products their creative products in these uh places by committee right for whatever reason this goat idea since it was kind of vaguely hip hoppy and it came to the fore at the same time was had by all these crepe hype dads and it was like boring enough that it passed through the creative gauntlet so the result was this very strange phenomenon where every ad, every brand suddenly was running a goat ad in the same year, which is this just very strange, weird uh, thing to have happen. So I wrote a piece about like tracking back from the goat ads, tracking back like why that had happened. And it's all this kind of genericism that you see inside modern agencies. Going back to uh, kind of the hype dad and how how the oh, let's call let's call it the the hype hypothetical hype dad and how they interrelate with uh, fellow teammates. Uh, so 
let's let's unpack the idea of hating your own ideas a little bit more. <laughs> um, so when do when did we start moving away from this? Like when did you just start thinking about this? How did you like? I have so many questions that I want to ask you personally. Uh, obviously, I'm fascinated by the the fact that you do this for a living and you write about the the state of our industry but like when did you start seeing this happen start seeing what specifically happened? uh the, basically uh these these ideas being you know interchangeable across pro uh, across product categories brought to market by these hype dads and they get they, them getting past these uh creative approvals uh you know with uh with no uh no objection no objections excuse me yeah, I'm trying to think about like where the this stuff starts to happen. I think you know where I when, when my first agency was like an influencer agency, mm -hmm. and do you remember the ice bucket challenge? Yeah. So every single meeting <laughs> at that agency at that time, the brand wanted to recreate the ice bucket challenge. They all wanted to do it, and look, it's not like super novel that clients are dumb and that there's trends. Like I'm not, I'm not like finding some amazing truth in, in life. That's, that's always been the case. People like trends, things are successful. Clients want to copy them. Monkey see, monkey do. We do this stuff, right? I think the difference is there's not any like there's no like safeguard. Like the reason you hire an agency, right? The whole point of an agency is to do the creative part and, and do all the stuff you don't want to do better than you, right? That's the why you do it. Otherwise, everything would be in-house, mm -hmm. uh, which you know, that's another trend we could talk about. Um, and I just think the agencies basically stopped being the safeguard and started being just part of the the regime like you know what i mean like you didn't have the wyden kennedy to to have this incredible idea that's really different it became that being the same was good you know it used to be that the whole i mean during the heyday of all this the whole point was to be totally different than the next guy whereas at a certain point for whatever reason being the same became currency in and in and of itself i don't know I, I'm I'm stre stretching and struggling to answer this. I don't know if I have the answer, but I mean, another way we could think about it is like, is, is the composition of the teams different? Uh, have you found maybe that uh, you've these the teams that work at the large organizations uh, are a little bit more risk averse, and uh, you know they don't they don't get that flexibility, that agility, that freedom that maybe smaller shops provide. Obviously, you run your own small shop, right? So, is that is that is it a talent thing? Chris, what are you trying to get me to say here, man? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'll say it. I Yeah, look, uh, it's undeniable that marketing is now entirely dominated by women. You, it's, you can't deny it. I, I've worked at so many different places. All of my bosses have been women at three different agencies, right? So when, when you have, look, I am not making any value judgment r right now. I am merely observing. And I'm saying that in my observations, mm -hmm. the marketing world is incredibly dominated by women. There are still, we're talking about hype dads though, right? There are still hype dads at the top of the food chain. Very much so. It's un undeniable. Um, so it's not that women are now necessarily in those top positions, but the core middle of the advertising world is now very dominated by women. Does that mean that women can't make good ads? I don't think that that means that women can't make good ads. I just think it has changed the nature of how the creative process works. And I think that, um, you know, I've I've worked with women who have incredible ideas, many of them, you know, and are, who are incredible writers, who are all those things. I don't think that it's saying anything about women's ability to make to make creative work. I think, though, it is you cannot sit here and say that. A locker room full of all women and a locker room full of all men are the same. They're not. It's just never. It's going to be a different type of of vibe. Mm -hmm. You know. I mean, we laugh about this stuff all the time. Remember, there was that hilarious. Uh, I think it was like Portlandia, or, or no, I think it was SNL, and it was like the difference between like the gay real world and the lesbian real world and the gay real world was all men like in thongs like you know like <laughs> like twerking mm -hmm. and then the lesbian real world was like they were like crying and like hugging their dogs and stuff 
like I realize I'm being stereotypical, but it, the fact is uh, that demographic inside these agencies has changed. And I do think that the risk aversion, uh, it's impossible to deny, to deny that some of this risk aversion and some of the ways in which dangerous or singular creative ideas are treated I will say, I, I can't lie, I do think that that has to do with the fact that now marketing is totally a female-dominated industry. So in, in terms of, um, see, I, I'll i take the other end. I still think we are now under, you either get a team who's revenue-focused or you get a team who is brand-focused and they're never going to like even try to connect their ad their, their ad efforts to dollars. And, and that's more the lens that, that I view things. Um, that's an interesting one I'd consider. I think that, um, I think comms has been, has always been biased female. I don't think that's a new thing. I, I think that's like always been the way our sector has been made up. Like media is, um, probably more biased women. I, I actually, um, most of my bosses have been women in my career and I've learned a ton from them. So, um, I, I, I don't know if, if, if I think that is necessarily the reason for iconoclast creative. I, I think more so how all of companies have, have treated marketing for a long time. They don't see it as a revenue generator. They see it as a cost center. And so, um, when there comes ESG scores that now marketing is accountable to, and that's an easy W for them to actually tick that box, I think marketers will do that. Um, that's worrisome for me because now marketing will start to get grouped similarly to HR and it, will, it won't be the strategic thing for businesses and we're never going to get back to bold, big, bold creative because it's just going to be something that people feel like they have to do as part of the company and it's going to get lumped in with something that's not performance oriented. So that's like my greater concern isn't, you know, if the CMO is a man or a woman, it's more like, you know, what are we, what are we being held to at the end of the day? And if that's correct, I think the things below should fall into place. Place. No, listen, I totally agree. I'm actually, I want to ask a question to you, but before that, I just want to clarify. I am not saying it matters whether, whether, whether your CMO is an individual man or a woman. I don't think that that does matter. I'm talking about this like middle class of advertising. That's the part that has now been totally, it's t like 90% women now because they're just drawn to this field. You know, now every woman gets a college degree. Every woman now has a job. That didn't used to be true 50 years ago. And what jobs do they choose? They choose marketing a lot and communications. So it's, again, I, I've always said it's not individual women. An individual woman, you know, is that's not it at all. It's that in an environment that is all women, you reach this tipping point where things change. And I really do think it changes from being a product oriented organization to being a community oriented organization. And one is not better than the other, by the way. I, I But if what we're looking for is great advertising, the one is not going to be as good as the other at, at making it. Anyway, that's my point. No, what I would no, ask that, you though, I'm sorry, sorry, go ahead. I, I was going to say that's, that's totally fair. And actually one could easily make the argument you, that there's not enough women that go into things like finance or STEM right. and there should be more women there. So I, I, I don't, to, to your point, what you're saying is, is accurate and valid. I just wanted to clarify um, just from my perspective about having awesome women leaders, but I, I think we agree totally. on this. Some of the best pe women, people I've worked with in the industry and my favorite people have been women. I, I'm, I'm not at all saying that on an individual le level, like women should be not you know, in these jobs and anytime, like, look, any man, no matter how sexist you are, anybody work with a woman on a creative project, you're not, that's all going to evaporate immediately. Like you're, you're, you know, you're instantly going to start collaborating. You're going to take her ideas. She's going to take your ideas. It's going to be a great um, environment. Anything will happen that way. So I, again, I'm not saying it's women. Um, but anyway, wait, what I wanted, sorry. No, that was my only response. <laughs> I, I just wanted to ask you back, Adam, um, you're saying this really insightful thing, which I totally agree with, which is that marketing has been decoupled from performance for some reason. So why though? But like, why has that happened? Because it seems like we have more performance indicators than ever. So why is marketing like backing off from performance? 
Um, I, I mean, it's a great question. I think you see a certain type of company, for example, it's probably a tech firm that is really good about using data throughout the organization and using data to inform everything from marketing, sales, customer support, et cetera. And then, you know, I've sat in the shoes, uh, I used to work on Google Analytics, so I was helping large companies use data better at a point when they should have already had a pretty sophisticated data org. And I, I left Google in like 2017, 2018. This is very late in the game. And I've come to a conclusion that there is a non-trivial percent of corporate America under the leadership of, I'm not biased to age because it isn't always the case, but under a certain um, style of baby boomer leadership does not want marketing to ever be accountable. They yeah, will hide either. from it. They want to do what they want. It's They want to follow what we lovingly refer to as the hippo in the analytics industry, highest paid per person's opinion. And they are basically the reason why if you ever talk to a CEO or CFO and you try to talk about Oh, well, if we spend this, you know, here will be the ROI of our ads. And they're like, wait, you can't measure ads, right? You've, we've all heard you can't measure ads, which is objectively untrue. Right. But yeah. I, I'm telling you, there is a decent chunk of leadership in the SMP that d will never even look at a dashboard from their performance team. They don't so view fun. it in that way. They don't so view weird. it. In, and that's why you also get... I think it's still something like $65 billion right now, right now is to linear cable right now, <laughs> which blows my mind because the only people you're reaching there are, you know, other baby boomers. And if you're running pharma ads for, you know, an osteoporosis medicine or there, but like there, there is just such a misallocation. I have a good tweet storm on this. And if you're listening to this and you're an enjoyer of internet content, whether it's a podcaster or a YouTuber, you should be upset that still dollars are being biased to 2 p.m. ad slots for Animal Planet that no one is watching. <laughs> it's an obscene amount. You wouldn't even believe how much it costs to run that ad. And yeah. it's, it is, yeah. you know, there, there is a misallocation in, in advertising. And I think this goes back to what we were talking about at the beginning of the conversation. But if everything was a data driven org, which we're like, wait, everything should be measurable marketing mixes would not look the way that they do. They just wouldn't. Yeah, no, it's, I, I couldn't agree more. Um, so yeah, th there's a lot of other things we could talk about. Um, one other area, um, you know, you've, you're obviously super internet savvy. Um, you, you know, you grew up using the internet. One thing that's been interesting to me, and maybe you can comment on this is my assumption would be at this point, like everyone would be super internet savvy. And actually, I think we're going the other direction. I think millennials and Xers who sort of grew up, went through, you know, dial up, you know, AOL, use the internet. They were, they're pretty sophisticated, but then you get to like Gen Z and they're kind of going backwards because they like skipped right to mobile. And it's like, if the UX isn't like dead simple, they can't get it. Um, if, if it's like, you know, requires any sort of, you know, they, they probably don't know how to set up like a network or anything like that. Um, your fingers on the pulse of culture. What are your thoughts on this? Because there, there's this bias that youth is tech savvy and I'm not, I'm not sure I see it. I think that's a great insight. This is not something I've thought about, but yeah, I think um, Gen Z, I think that's a great point you make that it's like, they don't know how the pipes work you know, it, because they've just had the toilet. So they never had to learn how to kind of like do the pipes part. So they're really actually less tax savvy, even though they're these digital natives. I think that's a really good point. Yeah. I only asked that, that question from an advertising perspective, because but here's my concern here. If you're only really good at, you know, taking photos for Instagram or editing TikTok videos or using social, right? That's one tactic. You can't think in systems. And then even worse than that, you can't think in broader narratives because now you're constrained to a, a micro content format. And I just worry for, you know, if we're going to get a return to classic advertising where there's sequenced creative over time to tell a broader story where there's, you know, bigger, bolder bets, you have to think so much larger than just your your mobile device, right? So if you're mobile only 
I, I worry with the message being the medium here, which is frequently true. You, you're not going to, you know, like, I, I guess when I see kids watching movies on their, on their phone, instead of on, you know, a gorgeous TV they have, or God forbid, going to a movie theater. Um, I, I, I just worry about what happens because that's a whole different generation of advertiser that's coming up very fast. That is going to be in the seat of decision-making too someday. But isn't it true that <clears throat> the more native you are in a way to a, um, it's like, think about movies. Like it used to be when movies were first coming out, it was like 95% of it was just figuring out how to even do the thing. And then 5% of it was the creative part. Whereas like now, maybe these Gen Zers can be like the seventies of movies, you know, like the new Hollywood where they're so comfortable with it and they're so accustomed to all the like nuances of the um, platforms that they get to really play around with it more. And, and I would say that hopefully maybe this means that, yeah, it's less about the ability to create it and it's more about the quality of it. I mean, you'd think, right? You'd think that, I mean, a glut is a weird phenomenon because a glut is like, economically speaking, the more of something, the more good of something there should be. But I think what we're kind of seeing right now is the more content, it's not leading to more good. It's actually kind of like you can't find the good. It's not there. It's that the cream is not rising to the top for some reason because we're just like deluged. Yeah. So in that sense, I'm sort of like, I, I agree with you that like it is, that's a scary thought to think that like good is gone and there's not going to be good anymore because nobody knows how to do it or anything like that. But on, on the hopeful side, I'm hoping that it's like once we get kind of accustomed to this glut, Hopefully, that will lead to a clearer um, understanding of what's good and what isn't. Maybe I, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Awesome. It's almost it's almost as if we celebrate the the process and the workflows as opposed to the output. You know, right? So, right. so yeah. I exactly. I, yeah, Isaac. This leads into my next question. Um, I loved you did an like a spec ad for Twitter. Um, that was fun. It had memes in it. It had a really cool, like, um, Russian electronic track in it. Um, Chris actually knew the language or the words that were said. Um, <laughs> and it, I, I like that because that showcased your meta understanding of what's going on in the social web, what's going on in the meme verse. Um, and, and I thought that one was really cool piece of creative something a silicon valley firm would never make you know you're you're talking you're definitely doing something outsidery which which i think is cool we were talking about individuals having perspectives but along with that um i know you have thoughts on this um do you think the advertising sector is missing how influence even works in modernity with a lot of the things they do and with um, maybe maybe not taking a stand on things and, and are, are they sort of missing the boat and where culture is going? Uh, what, what I mean by that is um, I think that your ad, for example, was, was very much at, at the bleeding edge of internet culture. And I guess I haven't seen any ad shops or companies ever do anything like that other than you know really really silly memes when they're already past popularity um like no ad firm has ever done a wojack meme right like they i don't even think they know what that is but do, are ad firms missing where influence is is it is it just too dangerous a space for them to be involved in real community i guess like like what's going on there why are you able to do cool creative why is few why are few others doing things like that well, they are willing to go to the bleeding edge though, right? They're just willing to go to the bleeding edge on random political things that have nothing to do with the brand. You know what I mean? Like they're they're totally willing to go to the absolute far edge of of left-wing discourse, right? I mean, they do that. This is why Bud Light happened. This is this is what's happening every day. We see them being Nike, right? Nike thought it was really edgy and cool to make Kaepernick their spokesperson, who was a very controversial person, right? I mean, that was an extremely edgy thing to do. Mm -hmm. So 
yet, yet, I totally agree. Like, did that feel edgy? No, it didn't feel edgy. It didn't, it felt just like what everybody else was doing. It didn't feel like they were narrowing in on anything really interesting or anything really telling about their products. Um, and you, you raise an amazing question. It's like gaming studios, right? Isn't there an opportunity to make like really cool, like super specific um, ads that feature the inside jokes of this gaming world? Which is, if if advertising wasn't frozen, that is what we would be seeing, and that and that's what that ad was, you know. And of course, oh, there's Pepe the Frogs in this ad. Oh my God! Like let's you know, whatever. Let's we can't even see the image of a Pepe the Frog. You know, it's like and and that's what the this cult of safetyism does. But again, it's not actually a cult of safetyism, is it? Because they, the hype dad and, and the people in these agencies, they have the desire. They all think of themselves as pirates. They all think of themselves as these edgy, you know, punk rock. They all want to go somewhere, right? It's just the only place they're allowed to go is extremely politically left. It's over and over. Extremely politically left. That They can just only go there. And they can't even go anywhere slightly, remotely, possibly the other way without being completely shut down. What, what was so weird to me about a lot of what's happening is if one were just let's pretend let's pretend politics don't even exist. And you saw the Bud Light ad from Dylan Mulaney. And I tweeted about this. And I was basically like, you know what? What if politics don't exist? At the end of the day, is this good creative? Period. And the answer from all of my friends and followers and media you know, people in, in our sector was no. And at the end of the day, I think as a brand, if you're going to do UGC or your own creative, if you're creative – is hated by anyone if you're a big national brand. You <laughs> failed at what you're doing. Your job is not to provoke tribal warfare online. And in fact, the 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 message of inclusivity is actually a great one for a brand like Bud Light. Like in in my in, if I were running brands over there and I wanted to do a message to unite the country, which I think is a good thing. I think we need more of it. It would it would have an inspirational ad showing everyone coming together, having a Bud Light, not giving a hoot what other people's beliefs are. And just like, you, you know, like that sort of thing. And, and I think you would get almost universal love from people. I saw a TikTok video responding to the to the Bud Light thing. And they're like, I don't care what, you know, what someone's preferences are, or, you know, it's that, but it's weird for, you know, for Bud Light to, to, to do this. Right. And so I think that was, that was the part for me is, is the creative. And we were talking about this a lot, but, but the creative was just weird. It just wasn't good creative. No, because it wasn't creative. It, it was, it would have been really great if you were advertising like off Broadway theater, but you're, you're advertising Bud Light and it's, uh, you know what I would do with it? it you're exactly right. If you made a uniting, a genuinely uniting message, You'd need to do it through Bud Light in a certain way, right? So what I would do, this is, Zero Hedge interviewed me about this, and I, I said, here's what I would do with Bud Light. This idea is very not fleshed out, but just as an example of a way to tie it together, here's one thing you could do. So Freedom, right? Freedom, the Bud, Budweiser used to rebrand their cans as Freedom. They rebranded as Freedom one year because they're constantly saying they are America and America equates to Freedom. So this was like a big part of their brand, Freedom, Freedom, Freedom. So if you wanted to like bring people together, right? You make an advertisement all around everyday freedoms. So you're using Freedom in kind of two ways. And what I mean is, if you're paying attention to TikTok, one of the most hilarious TikTok trends is this, uh, it's like a sound shared amongst the Hispanic community of Mexican construction workers secretly drinking on the job. And there's like a funny sound that goes along with it, but it's totally not like racist. It's like they're sharing it amongst each other. So like it's become this kind of like uniting thing amongst like working class people. So you would take that idea of like this everyday freedom, like sneaking a little like drink 
and you do it with every group. So it would be like you'd have the working class people taking their little bit of everyday freedom. You'd have the white collar guy taking his bit of everyday freedom. And then you'd have like the gay trans performer taking their bit of everyday freedom. You know what I mean? Like you would unite everybody through this shared thing of like sneaking a sip of Bud Light when you're not supposed to. That's what a good advertisement would do. It would take this insight, right? It's all about insights. It would take an insight about like, when's the time people drink Bud Light when you're not supposed to? And it would show that, look, everybody has this thing in common versus just showcasing, you know, this person that has nothing to do with the brand and not linking it to any larger thing that anybody can relate to. If they'd done the exact same Dylan Mulvaney thing as part of a everyday freedom campaign that had a, a conservative influencer that can had a, you know, all kinds of different people. No one would have cared. It was how they did it. That was really what pissed people off. hundred percent. I, I think that's something that it, that's something where I think for the ad industry, it's, it's so mind boggling for people like us, because what you said, that's a great creative concept. And somehow they couldn't even get like the basic tenets of what you would do for for for, for an ad. And um, I, I think there's a lot of reasons for that. I think if you listen to some of the podcast interviews with their marketing executives, I, I think in a lot of cases, a lot of people end up in marketing from the Peter principle. They just kind of fail yeah. into it. It's yeah. this field where, look, I've sat in rooms where um, – on the agency side where my client contact had ambition to be CEO and CMO almost never yeah, gets almost made never, into CEO. Right. Yeah, it's always COO yeah, or CFO. Yeah. I've seen them That's pass true. over time and time again. Yeah. And so what happens is you get a lot of people that are just there and ticking a box. And that actually, that explains a lot of things that happen in marketing. Here's the, here's the cool part though. And maybe the optimistic part for everyone listening who, you know, has ambition to be an executive one day. I think things have changed and we see missteps by marketers causing, you know, 25% off company share price in a month. And I think what's happened in a connected world is marketing has quietly become the largest driver for a lot of these types of, of businesses. And now brand is really the final mode when everything becomes commoditized and everyone has, you know, all of these modern communication tools and levers. And if you don't have great people as stewards of your brand, it's going to spread very quickly. That contagion of doing something that causes a distaste in the consumer's mouth will, you know, it will wreck you. And so hopefully this will be a balancing function where companies are like, well, you know, there is risk here in doing something stupid, but there's also reward in doing something great. And if we can get back to that point, I think everyone will be a lot happier in our industry and we can get back to fo focusing on the type of, you know, inspirational work that, that, you know, inspires Chris every day that, you know, his, his, you know, people like Ogilvy that he looks up to um, do, and we can get back to that stuff. Yeah. So, I mean, how do we get back to that world? <laughs> <laughs> I guess is the question, right? Oh, how, well, you're asking me. Oh, I mean, I, I'm just throwing it out there. I mean, <laughs> you mean the world of David Ogilvy? Yeah, I mean, well, th th that's never coming back. But I don't think that's coming I think back. The, the the world of advertising being a craft and yeah. not yeah. a committee, right? Right. Well, so I I was thinking of uh, I'll, I'll do this double answer for what both of you were saying. I think the best hopeful example recently of this, did you see what happened with the um, Coinbase Super Bowl commercial? Oh yeah, with the uh, Martin Agency. And yeah. uh, uh, can, can you kind of fill, fill the audience in on that, Isaac? Sure, sure. So what happened there is um, the Martin Agency, uh, huge advertising firm responsible for my favorite campaign of all time, which is most interesting man in the world, for Dos Equis, um, they uh, were approached by Coinbase. Obviously, this is height of crypto. So Coinbase has unlimited money to do a Super Bowl ad. And so uh, Martin Agency has now been, is now run by a very like absolute archetypal sort of girl boss uh, creative director 
who or ECD, whatever she is. She's the head of the whole company. And, you know, you see her tweets. It's all exactly what you would expect. Nothing cre- nothing interesting <laughs> in terms of creative. It's just all politics and like, you know, nothing, not concerned with the, the quality of the creative. Anyway, what happens is Super Bowl happens. Coinbase is commercial, is just a screensaver bumping the corners of a screen, which is kind of a meme in computer circles. We were just talking about this, right? And just as it's going to the the corner where it's going to hit the corner perfectly, which is like the funny moment uh, for these old screensavers when it perfectly hits the corner, uh, the screen like opens up and you see that it's a Coinbase ad and it's a QR code that's bouncing around and you're supposed to hit the QR code and that's the whole ad, right? So what is the cost of this ad to make? It's got to be absolute de minimis versus these celebrity-filled commercials that cost $15 million plus to make. So the ad is the most successful Super Bowl ad, I think, in a decade. It, like, crashed the website, which, you know, you always hear that. Whether that's true or not, you never know because that comes from PR. But it, they said it crashes the, the website, and it was the one that people talked about. You, It was the one that people were like, oh, haha, that was a funny, clever Coinbase ad. And so nobody really talked about it for a couple of weeks. And then a few weeks later, the CEO of Coinbase, whose last name is Armstrong. I can't remember if it's Brad. I think maybe Brian. it's Brad. Brian. 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 It's Brad. Brian. Brian. Oh, yes, right. Brian Armstrong, uh, the head of the Coinbase, who's kind of a Elon Muskish type, right? Like he he uh, banned politics from the workplace. Like he's clearly kind of on a new. The crypto people are generally very like meritocrat meritocratic. So he does a tweet thread about like, oh, I'm getting a ton of questions about how this came to be. This ad came to be, and he was he says. We were put in touch with a big prominent agency. He doesn't name the agency, but he says we're, we were put in touch with a prominent agency, one of the tops, and they pitched to us a deck full of ideas that were really lame. He doesn't say really lame, but he uses some word. And he was like, they were just the same crap you see everywhere. A bunch of like kitschy, stupid, quippy ideas with like six celebrities. And by the way, we're going to pay each of these celebrities a million dollars. And how much is the agency going to take off the top, Right. So a smart CEO is going to look at that and say, why would I pe- spend $15 million sorry, $15 when you million know. or however much this is going to cost me on top of whatever I'm paying for this time? I mean, you guys would be able to tell me how much time costs, but what, it's like $3 million for 30 seconds or something? Six. Yeah, six, six million for 30 seconds. And... On top of that, I'm going to have to pay $15 million to produce this like mini movie, pay all these celebrities. Why am I doing this? <laughs> so in a very rare move, he didn't like any of the agency's ideas, and he explains this, and he fired the agency. He said, eh, you know what? We're not doing this. We're just going to do this on our own. And they come up with this idea for a screensaver, and they they did end up paying a production company to pull it off. But I mean, what did they pay their production company? Less than a million dollars probably? Yeah. And because it's just a screensaver. And then it blew up. It was the most successful ad of the entire time. So he tells this story on Twitter as like a indicator of like how to run your business clearly. And then the girl boss CEO of the Martin agency comes out and starts criticizing him (laughs) and saying like, Oh, why are you talking shit about us? So she reveals that it was them who uh, made the bad pitch that the Mm -hmm. client didn't like, which was a absolute insanity. I mean, it's like, the idea that you would ever want to be proud of the fact that a client fired you for having bad ideas, it just goes to show the whole industry, the mainstream industry is done. It's just, it's like the fact that she would think that that is a, it just means she doesn't care about the creative basically. Right. Which is the whole point we're making. Mm -hmm. Um, But I thought that that whole story, and then, you know, she's trying to call him sexist and yada, yada. Uh, I don't think he ever really backed down, so it, it was totally fine. But I think that that story is uh, a bastion of hope, Chris. To go to to the um, to go to the question you were asking of how do we get back there? Like the more CEOs we have that are these disagreeable kind of Musk types, like Brian Armstrong, like Elon, you know, the more of these guys we have, 
the more we will get back to this meritocratic results-based world of advertising where what's good actually will rise to the top. The level of cultural shift that we have to get do though to get there, I mean, how do we do it? Yeah, this is why I launched Will. This is the entire reason I launched my agency was because I felt like the market was ripe enough to support marketing that is actually good, you know, and, and doesn't cost you a million dollars to do nothing. Uh, but it's tough, man. It's tough because they, it's, you know, they, they own a lot of the uh, means of the production. So it's, it's hard to, to get there. I I'd like to chime in and say um, one, one thing Isaac mentioned that every marketer, if you're, if you're a young marketer, um, I strongly believe in this. I've used unknown talent in ads I've made my entire career, 15 years I've been in marketing, just did for the ad we shot for AdQuick. And let me tell you something, not only is it a fraction of the cost, but that talent will work 10x harder, be like zero, there's 0% pretentiousness with them. They need and want the work. They um, want to make a name for themselves. And um, it's just so much better than working with celebs for advertising, particularly because I, I actually think the notion of celebrity is going to go away other than like, if you can get a Ryan Reynolds, which you can't get, but having these like C and D list celebs in your ads, nobody cares anymore. I mean, I'm just going to say it. It's like such a dated notion. Um, yeah. People care about what their friends think, but if you're going to run an ad, um, I'll die in the cell. You guys can tell me I'm an idiot, but I use unknown talent and you can spend time sourcing it and you will get great creative and you don't have to pay millions of dollars per person. I just have to throw that in there. Every time we talk about celebs and ads, I, <laughs> I mean, even, even if you recall on Twitter, Adam, like, uh, one of my friends who is deep in the Hollywood scene in Los Angeles, he was like, who are these people? I mean, <laughs> and, then, and then I had a tweet. It's like, even that, even the Hollywood people can't keep, you know, keep the tabs on who these people are and that they don't know who they are. It's like, and, and I 100% agree that, you know, um, if going back to what, uh, Isaac was talking about, you know, if they, if Coinbase had gone with one of those ideas that were presented to them, I'm sure it would have looked a lot like FTX's ads, right? Which is like, who did they have? Every, 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 they had Steph Curry, they had Larry David, you know, it would have been something like that, right? And, yep. and in terms of still, still culture, if you are an ad decision maker and you are making a Super Bowl ad, like what a cool opportunity to platform a, a new talent. Even if you wanted to do a celebrity, why do you have to do like someone everyone already knows? Like get some like really obscure celebrity and do something, do something super creative. I, I think that that's probably a more memorable thing too, because you know, does everyone want to see like like Taylor Swift is in a, a Capital One commercial? Like, who cares? She's everywhere. Yeah. It's, if if you were to think about like the the value of um, advertising from like an attention perspective, like you want things that that are sort of maybe a little bit more obscure, maybe that aren't so common, maybe not super in the vernacular. Like kind kind of um, it, it, the way to think about it, if 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 you're an investor, like you find these sort of small cap gems that are undervalued, you invest in them early and they can become known for the ad that you did. If it was super good. Right. I mean, th there's ads that we all remember from our childhood and almost none of them actually have celebs in them. You, you just remember the ad creative, right. If you were to think back. So I, I yeah. think there's opportunity there and you don't have to spend all this money for, you know, to have the rock in an ad or something like that. Not that the rock is bad. It's just, you know, <laughs> think for yourselves, do something different. Rock I can't think of one. Is there a great campaign in his from history that has, that has a celebrity in it? There must be, but well, I'm thinking the first ad I thought of is uh, the Sears ad, you know, where, where, you know, I'll go today to get the, the air conditioner. I'm just thinking of all these ads from my childhood and it was not usually typical. In fact, if you look at, um, I think Paul Rude's like first, first like thing was a TV ad. Now he's super famous. He's great. Yeah. But that's like how it used to be done. You would be in a TV ad before you were in a movie yeah, and right. before you were like turn into this megastar, right? You had to start somewhere. Brian Cranston, I think, was in ads before Seinfeld and Breaking Bad and all that stuff. Or the, the usage of it has to be really clever and specific to the person. Like, I'm thinking of uh, You're Not You When You're Hungry, remember with Betty White, the Snickers yeah. ad? 
those were fantastic and those were really 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 good or um uh mayhem the all state oh, yeah. he's you know? great all he's great. but neither of those were about they needed that celebrity to like support the concept. It wasn't, they weren't the concept, you know, they, they were supporting the concept because yeah. they had that character. Well, now that we're in such a culture of famous for being famous, it's, right. it's leaned on. It's used as a crutch mm -hmm. to overcome bad creative. Okay. Well, we can't, we'll get the star cause we yeah. want them and they're hot versus let's think of a story. Right. Exactly. I mean, like I see Kevin Hart plastered on everything and like yeah. Kevin Hart isn't going to make me want to buy anything. Yeah. You know? right. Right. <laughs> I would trust Kevin Hart with like maybe like jeans for short people or something. <laughs> yeah. An yeah, yeah. Another thing not talked about and we don't have to talk on this too long because I, I know we're just over the hour, but I think this is a fun topic. No, I, um, I, I got nowhere to be. So, <laughs> awesome. oh, yeah. so, so <laughs> I, I want to talk. Um, this is a cool topic. Um, celebrity endorsements and the background of the celebrity itself. So one example is Tom Brady shilling cryptocurrencies at the top, and now he's shilling for Hertz. And I guess my question is, can a celebrity do something like push a shady asset class or, or something else? And then later on, should that person then be given a million dollar contract by a brand? Are we, is it, does it not matter what people do anymore? Um, is this even something advertisers should have to think about? Uh, cause, cause to me, it's weird where I actually really like Tom Brady, but like when you torch your reputation like that, like, aren't you kind of torching like everything you say after that, since you, you may have pumped something that was illegitimate, like, like for, with my marketing hat on, I'm like, but how many customers don't trust that guy now, right? Am, am I the crazy one or am I overthinking this? It definitely hurts his like equity. You know, it hurts his personal equity for sure. And it, it makes him seem shallow and it makes him seem less cool. I mean, a hundred percent, you know, I mean, it's, it makes him seem like he's just willing to do anything and not really think about it. I mean, this kind of goes back a little bit to our discussion about, agency like tom brady should have an agent who this is the agent's job the agent's job and the manager's job is to navigate these things and to say hey you know this crypto thing i don't know you know may, maybe this isn't what we should do but again like everything's kind of morphing into this one singular thing where there is no like agent the agent's just going to be like oh gravy train you know like I'm getting a bunch of money, whoever else is getting a bunch of money. There's not really a lot of like independent thought. But yeah, I mean, I think it's not obviously like it's not like Tom Brady has to like stop working, but it definitely hurts him. I mean, I think there's uh, I'm trying to think of like other is there other examples of that from history? Like somebody who shilled for something that then I mean, it kind of works in the reverse. Like if OJ Simpson was in your ads, <laughs> it hurts your brand. Well, he, he used to be yeah, he used to be the spokesperson for rent a car. Oh, I think yeah, Budget right. or Avis or one of the one of the brands. But uh, one of the strangely enough, going back to Taylor Swift, Taylor Swift was the only person that was like, yeah, I'm not going to shill FTX. This sounds like an unregistered security. <laughs> the, only, uh, the, rock, the, the rock star is the only person who doesn't need an agent because she's got common sense well right. the, to isaac's point um i or think there's got a good agent and yeah. you no know, to, to isaac's point i i think that there's probably a need for if you're a talent agent now to understand everything from the culture wars to you know different types of companies you're actually going to be part of like the diligence for that role now is definitely should, should be much higher than it is I have never met a worse group of people than the agents that they are genuinely the worst people in the world and they don't do anything. Their entire job is gatekeeping and being useless middlemen. I, I, you know, I live in LA, so the agents here are, they're like Kings, like they're like the Goldman Sachs people. Mm -hmm. And I hum, I've hung out with them. I've seen how they work. They are just absolutely like, totally useless they they do absolutely nothing and it's unbelievable i can't believe that they're still having as much power as they had and i can't imagine that the current job of agent is anywhere remotely what it started out to be like it's just become this power center that no one elected nobody wants it yet it just governs everything in entertainment 
do you think in the future there will there will even necessarily be as many agents no, when no, it, no, in, no. I think they'll all die. Yeah, because like like in a world where you have someone like Mr. Beast who comes up on their own, right? And he was doing everything from you know coming up with the video concepts to editing to getting sponsor. And of course now he's hired people for different parts. But I almost feel like um since we talked about Hollywood and the media industry being sort of stuck. Anything new that comes out and breaks through, you even saw Mr. Beast in the Super Bowl ad, sort of has to be someone who, you know, built their own sort of brand and platform, which by definition, they probably wouldn't be super willing to just see decisions to someone who wasn't part of that journey. Yeah. So, you know, it's, it's funny. I wrote a piece in uh, American Mind that just came out yesterday arguing that kind of along the lines of what you're saying, that it's like... <clears throat> The technology, especially now with AI, has gotten so good that really teams of people are a lot less necessary than they used to be. You don't really need other people anymore. So great creatives should maybe like every great creative in the future will be like an auteur who runs their own company who uses AI. They use all these things themselves and they don't have an agent at all. And it does seem like we're heading in that direction, right? Like Louis CK, no more agent. Like more and more people are really abandoning this and figuring out how to individually monetize and save all the nonsense and then just be totally in control of their own destiny. The issue is that Mr. B stuff sucks. <laughs> it's like, you know what I mean? Like, like that's what that, it's, it's like, all he's right. For, I, he's for kids. He's for right. Kids. He's for kids. Like, like I'm happy for Mr. Beast. I'm sure he's a great entrepreneur, but it's like, unfortunately the problem with this is that we're again, we're losing the Weinstein class. Like, like better to do it by yourself than having these terrible like tech managers do it. But the issue is then what rises to the top? It's democracy. And do we really want democracy? Like, no, we don't want fucking democracy. I mean, like, the not not of creative. Again, like, we don't want to be just like, oh, the only people who are successful are the people who can make a YouTube thumbnail of themselves being like, you know, struck by, yeah, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Or like their pants are falling off. Like, pants fell off in public. You know, it's like, you don't want that either. So it's like, uh, I think it's encouraging to think of getting rid of these terrible agents. But on the other hand, I don't want to be just at the mercy of the of the, the the masses either. So do you think the do you think um like things like YouTube algos and and Twitter algorithms and Facebook algorithms um do unfortunately reward mediocrity and pandering versus iconoclasts? Yeah, they do. I mean, they totally do. And that's what AI also is. AI is mediocrity. It is yes, literally it's average. It's, yeah, it's the average. It's the yeah. average of everything. It's the average of every you ask it a question you know, what's the deal with this thing? It is the average of every shitty blog post that has ever been written about that thing. Yeah. You know, so it's like, I'm it's doing my part. Wait, 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 what? I said, I'm doing my part to help. Yeah. yeah, my, yeah, my yeah. Blog I'm doing my part too. Like I'm throwing it in there. Yeah. You know? And so, uh, yeah, no, I mean, it sucks. It's, it's like, you want to believe in, in the power of, uh, demo, like, you know, the power of, to the people I'm speaking to the people, but Unfortunately, it just kind of balkanizes us. You know, it's like you can still be a creator, you know, like like me or like whoever, you know, like you, Adam, who has an audience of their own um, and you can make a living off of that eventually. But is that really what you want? You know, I mean, like there's so many people in my scene who their biggest fear is to get ghettoized as like just uh, somebody who has their little niche. They're speaking to the people who love them. And then that's it. Like. That kind of sucks because then there is no uniting potential. There's no potential for people to hear different messages. So I don't know if we have a solution to that yet, really. I mean, hopefully we will. But Well, Isaac, this has been awesome. I think what we can do is we can think about this. And on your podcast, we can yeah. continue this discussion okay. because you've given us a lot. You've given me a lot to think about. Um, Chris, do you have any finalized questions for Isaac as we wrap up? No, I think we, uh, we covered most of them. Um, and, uh, I'm, got, I'm really happy with, uh, the quality of answers that we, we got to. I mean, I mean, I, Isaac is just someone you would want to sit down with for a coffee or a whiskey or whatever, and just hear him talk. Cause he's, 
he he's got the classic ad creative vibe. He's got I, that, you know, that 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 sort of Madison Avenue vibe about him where he's unencumbered by a lot of the things that are happening in media. You can just the creativity shows through when he speaks. I would definitely drink a Bud Light with Isaac. <laughs> yeah, that's what we need to be drinking. All right. All right. Awesome. Thank you. No, I appreciate it. This was great. I really enjoyed this. Well, Thank you, everyone, for listening. We'll see you again next week. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe down below in the uh, buttons below the video on YouTube. And we will see you again shortly. Bye.